bit more open, we've had a whole lot of people we're trying to fit in there and we still have to decide how best to fit them in. So we'll send an update as soon as we can, um, hopefully well before Wednesday. Um, also, additionally to this structure of last week of alternating afternoon and morning main sessions, we are organizing, um, trying to do something to give you the impression that you're actually in Cambridge and wandering around the very beautiful Newton building. And the, the most beautiful bit of the Newton Institute's architecture is that it has a mezzanine between the first and second floors arranged so that people cannot get to their offices without having to cross an open space where they can get hijacked by fellow researchers who wish to discuss something. Um, and, and so this sort of coffee room area is a vital part of how the Newton Institute functions. And this is difficult to reproduce online, but we thought we'd have a bit of a try with a virtual coffee room, which we're going to try on Wednesday morning. Um, we'll say more about that ne nearer the time. Um, so, um, now the first thing I want to is, it, have we got Adam Kucharski here yet? Adam? Yes, he, yes, he uh, was yeah. around. Yeah. yeah, you're there. Okay, fine. So, um, because um, then I don't have to just keep on speaking till 10 past, which will probably be a great relief to people. Um, so, could I just say a um, little bit about the sort of rules of the game? I think when we're having open discussions like that, it's nice if people... Um, do actually show who they are, and preferably with a live person rather than a, a logo. Um, if you, um, you can either um, have a real background or, or you can uh, compete in the stakes of um, what I'm told is called bookcase credibility. Um, there's a whole beautiful Twitter stream of uh, examples of people with backgrounds they've presumably chosen to impress or, or not. Um, but I think the etiquette is that, um, we show our faces when we're actually discussing with each other um, and then we perhaps go, go blank um, and have our microphones muted while the speaker is doing their presentation. Um, the other thing to say about this afternoon's proceedings is that after we've had the two presentations and questions and answers, we'll have a discussion session where we will be put into breakout rooms, which will, where you'll be, um, which will be as far as possible randomly allocated um, so that you'll go into a smaller group of people both to get to, to, to meet some of the other participants but also to um, try and come up with some good points to, for a, discuss, a final discussion of the session. Um, and then we'll have a tea break between 4 and 4.30 after which we have Alessandro Vespignani from Northeastern University uh, giving a plenary lecture. So I think at this point I should ask um, Megan, the administrator, if she's got anything she'd like to say. Megan is actually in charge this afternoon. Yes, um, I don't have uh, too much to say. Just uh, if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to ask me over chat or um, email me directly um, at programs at newton.ac.uk. Um, but that's about it for me. Right. And um, actually, that reminds me that, that, that um, for questions on the presentations, could you please use the chat facility? Um, and um, Peter, I think, is, Peter Trapman has volunteered to be in charge of monitoring the questions. So if, if during a presentation you think of a question, then put it into the chat um, to, to everyone or just direct it to Peter Trapman as you like. And this, uh, we'll try and get a, a good question session at the at the end of the presentation. So I think, um, I think really that uh, is all that needs saying by way of introduction. So thank you all for coming. And I hope we're going to have an interesting week. And Megan, I think um, you're in charge to sh 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 um, uh, allow Adam Kucharski to um, share his screen and, and give his presentation. I'm very sorry, it um, jutted there. Um, can you say that again? It's Adam Kucharski. So, um, can you allow Adam to share his screen? Um, I guess. AK. It's AK as a symbol. Okay. 
Sorry. Put my hand up to make it easier. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> and now you've just moved. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one second. I do apologise. This is the first time I've started doing this. Um, I guess you must become co-host like you did with Kira. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Got it. <laughs> okay. There you go. Now he is. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Um, uh, just find the thing. Okay. Can you see some slides? Yes. Perfect. Um, first of all, thanks for the, uh, to the organizers uh, for, for inviting me to, to present on behalf of some of the work we've been doing. And, and thank you for putting together just a, an amazing program at such, uh, such short notice. It's been, uh, been great, all the, all the sessions I've managed to, to attend. Um, I want to just give an overview of some of the modeling we've done in, in the context, I think, of some of the broader modeling questions. Um, and also just talk a bit about some of the, the kind of challenges and uh, we think potential solutions in terms of uh, encouraging open uh, outbreak science. So trying to address some of the issues with actually getting this, this work out there and kind of available to the wider community uh, quickly. Um, first of all, uh, I want to acknowledge that everything I'm presenting is, is the work of many people um, at London School. We've got a working group um, who are listed here um, and of course many colleagues, collaborators, um, partners, many of the people here, um, a lot of the work we've done has built on the, uh, on the great work that you've been doing as well. So we just thanks to everyone who's working um, on the response in, in any capacity. Uh, I want to really just go through what I think are some of the, the broad applications of modelling, um, certainly what we've been doing and many other groups as well, um, in terms of understanding the epidemiology, um, looking at scenarios for control, uh, giving some situational awareness about where we are in the outbreak and then talk a bit, as I mentioned, about um, the, the kind of aspects of open science that feed into this. Um, so I think for us early on, one of the priorities was, was of course, understanding um, the infection. The, yeah, for COVID, we, we kind of really started from, uh, to some extent, from scratch. I mean, we had viruses like SARS and MERS, other respiratory infections to draw on, but a lot of the key questions were still relatively um, unclear, particularly early on. So some of the early work we did was, uh, was focused on understanding the dynamics of, of transmission in Wuhan. There's obviously a lot of work um, initially trying to get estimates of the reproduction number. And then as these control measures came in in January, trying to identify what the potential effects might have been. I think given the, the, the noise in the data um, at the time, actually even just untangling whether a city-wide lockdown for a spiritual infection would have any impact um, was one of the major challenges. Uh, another big question was this, this estimation of pre-symptomatic transmission. There's a, a diagram here from a couple of colleagues that um, essentially looked at the, the relationship between serial interval and um, an incubation period. And, and even quite early on, um, sort of in, in sort of early Feb, the, the signals from data that they were getting were, were suggesting that pre-symptomatic transmission was, was, was happening. And, and this obviously puts you in a parameter space where um, certain elements of control are going kind of become much harder. We also did quite a lot of work early on with um, trying to get a handle on the, the infection or case fatality um, risk and particularly feeding into to estimates of what we were facing, um, combined with the fact that a lot of the Chinese data um, was, was incredibly noisy and probably focused at the severe end of the spectrum. So actually, the I remember early on that there were these these values of about 3% being quoted for, for the simple ratio of cases to deaths. But if you actually adjusted out for delays, it was suggesting a, a case fatality ratio of about, um, about 15%, which based on international cases, we didn't believe, but actually pinning that down um, was, was a pretty important question. Um, there's also been nice work by some of my colleagues in, in the, the illustration here with age patterns of severity. So again, an emerging signal from the data was that there was this uh, this what seemed like m much more um, careful reporting in older groups, which we've seen for MERS, um, SARS as well. But obviously you have this identifi uh, identifiability problem of is it that these groups just aren't getting infected or is it that everybody's getting infected and some groups are just showing um, more severity? And there's some, some quite nice work um, 
that a number of colleagues have done with evidence synthesis, trying to pull together all the little bits of information we have um, and suggesting that there, there is a pretty clear um, pattern of severity with age, which aligns with our data sets. Um, there's probably some in terms of susceptibility, but the pattern is probably slightly less clear um, across settings. And then more recently, we've tried to, to, to bring together um, a lot of the emerging data sources um, to just try and say something useful about, about characteristics of transmission. So for example, what settings are linked to transmission, um, where are clusters occurring, basic epidemiological values like the secondary attack rates, can we actually get some handle on, on what this is based on where you are? Um, and then meta-analyses, there's been quite a few going on. A recent one that was that was made public was things like length of hospital stay, because actually, because in different countries, definition of admission is, it varies and some places use hospitalization as a method of isolation. You actually see quite considerable variation, but obviously in models, um, these parameters are pretty key. If you want to talk about things like um, beds in use over time, you really need, need these kind of inputs. And in many cases, we were doing rapid reviews of this alongside model development to make sure we were at least uh, in the right ballpark for these things. Um, I think a few things kind of jumped out for us um, in, in doing this work. Uh, one is that I think particularly in real time, um, results often have a very limited shelf life um, for usefulness. I think that's fine. And I think that's, that, that still means they're useful. I think that's just a, an awareness we, we, that's important to have. So for example, once you have really good serological surveys and population studies, you can just get the, get at the case fatality risk directly and get the infection fatality risk directly as we're now seeing. But early on, um, we needed those estimates for um, scenario planning uh, and we had to kind of make do with the limited data we have. So we had this period of about a month where we were getting early estimates out. I know um, Hong Kong U and, and Imperial got some nice work out as well. Um, but those were really the values that a lot of these models were hinging on because at the time there wasn't better data. So I think this idea that if you can get something quick that's roughly correct, um, that's generally much better than having a model that, that comes month late, months later when probably the, the, the data have overtaken you and actually that question is no longer relevant. Um, another really, I think, important aspect from a lot of the work that's been done is evidence synthesis, that um, a lot of the data we've dealt with hasn't been sufficient to get the answer we want. So really finding ways of combining um, data to try and make sure you're not relying too much on, on a handful of data points that might have issues. So the, the schematic here shows an early model we used for transmission in Wuhan. And we had a model within Wuhan that we could fit to uh, cases reported there. We could also look at things like prevalence on um, some of the evacuation flights coming out of the city. We also had a sub model of people who traveled internationally so we could fit to international data um, in terms of onset of symptoms and subsequent reporting. Um, and what this meant is that even if the data did something a bit odd, so in, in early February, for example, China um, reported a load of cases that were backdated. So you see this huge spike in, I think it's around the 13th. Um, but if you've got other data sets feeding into your model, that means you can still be exploring those questions um, without you know, having one data, uh, data set that you're, you're increasingly kind of a bit cautious about. Um, I think the other thing we've tried to do um, I know other groups as well, is, is designing mo models with the expectation that data will arrive. In Outbreak, you, you typically have this, not totally predictable, but, but somewhat predictable timeline in when data will occur. That early on, you'll get very rough case data. Um, you'll see emergence of subnational data. Eventually, you'll get serial surveys. Eventually, you'll probably get large-scale population screening. And so some of the work we've done, for example, around real-time analysis is having the, um, the pipeline set up to handle that kind of data knowing that it's not available yet but obviously for example with with subnational reproduction number calculations when that data comes in um the, the methods are flexible enough to very quickly get outputs for it so i think uh that's kind of our our way of, of almost just trying to get ahead of of the the information epidemic as it were um to, to make sure that we've actually got analysis set up for, for somewhat predictable um data streams the second uh, and i think probably more high profile, um, certainly from the media perspective, in terms of the, the modeling work that goes on, is exploring um, control scenarios. And we've looked at a whole range of these. And um, as Des mentioned at the start, there's obviously these groups that feed into UK governments. Um, so a, number, a whole range of UK modeling groups will feed results into SPIM, which will then feed 
um, consensus statements and some of these results into Sage, which will then feed into um, the, the cabinet office meetings that, that ultimately make those decisions. And so it's very rare that um, you have a, a major question that only one group are looking at. Often there'll be a number of, of related analyses around these questions. And ones that, for example, we were involved in alongside others were questions around case isolation, um, tracing and quarantine early on. And as has is, is been established in a lot of nice modeling work, um, particularly post SARS, if you have pre-symptomatic transmission, if you have these delays, if you have missed cases, uh, very quickly you end up in a, in a scenario where you're gonna struggle to contain um, the outbreaks. I think that's what we've seen in a number of countries. Even even places with very good protocols are, are often adding additional measures alongside. We also did work um, on traveler screening and follow-up. Again, a, a well-established result um, for from, from modeling is that if you're screening just on symptoms at arrival and you have an incubation period, you will get cases being missed. So we also looked at, at the need for traveler um, follow-up. If you have kind of awareness of symptoms and, and subsequent reporting, how does that affect things? I think also we're we're now moving into territory where probably the 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 sort of policies and strategies being considered are ones which very few models will have looked at if at all. So I think even you know having two week quarantines to all incoming travellers, um, these aren't I think the common scenarios that models have considered in the past. Um, and so obviously there's updating to be done as these these kind of things change. Um, in a number of countries, obviously, containment solely with isolation and, and tracing struggled uh, to stop transmission. So we have seen these large scale social distancing strategies uh, in place and a lot of early work we did. And um, there's been a lot of nice work from, from US groups, from Australian groups um, uh, in, in France. There's, there's been modeling work around this and a number of other um, colleagues as well. And I think everyone's pretty you know, on the same page that if you sit back and do nothing, this is going to be a very, it would have been a very large epidemic, very rapidly overwhelmed um, ICU. And obviously the data uh, supports that. In the picture here, it's worth noting that social distancing, um, this is, is kind of very light social distancing. So it's not a lockdown. Um, in, in, I think in this particular one, it was, it was just reducing a fraction of, of contacts kind of outside, um, outside home and work. Um, but even so you can see, you, you very quickly um, end up in a situation where the outbreak is hard to manage. And we're still doing ongoing work um, around different aspects of this and, and many other groups are as well. But I think uh, it's sort of looking forward on, on where are we with control and what are some of the questions that we're interested in, I think a, a really important one is just evaluation of, of measures. That a lot of places, to give examples, you know, Hong Kong, um, Ben Cowling gave that really nice talk last week, um, Korea, have had many measures going in. Um, and I think untangling which are important, what's the contribution to control from remote working, school closures, testing, um, contact tracing, these all have potential to make a difference, but actually untangling them is, is I think going to be key. And I, th I thought Ben's talk was really nice in actually just looking at the transmission dynamics over time and overlaying the different measures that have gone in and then trying to, to at least get an upper and lower bound on plausibly what working from home or, or tracing or masks might be doing. Um, and I think that's, that's a really useful approach. I think we need to be doing that in more settings. I think also just in terms of modeling, we're probably going to need a combination of approaches um, going forward. I, I don't think there's going to be a magic solution to this. And so can we use the interactions, the sort of some of the, um, the feedback processes between these, these measures uh, to improve their effectiveness so an obvious one for example is if you have settings where certain contacts are hard to trace introducing control in that setting will not only reduce transmission it will also improve the effectiveness of your contact tracing so i think there's a lot more questions that we could be exploring around these feedback processes and actually how one how a combinations of control measures can be more than the sum of their parts um and i think an idea which anyone who's, who's thought about SARS and MERS and these pathogens would have in mind is um over dispersion in transmission that we see super spreading events we see setting specific transmission um to what extent can we can we target this i mean this uh, was a nice epi report in uh, in eid of a call center outbreak in, in korea you see very clear cluster clustering in the office of infection um so i think the more um that we can use this kind of you know on the ground epi uh, information to to inform our ability to target measures uh, and and ideally allow you know, more elements of normal routine in some in some settings, but keep the extensive distancing and infection control in places that are going to be um, higher risk. 
the, I think the third aspect that, that for us modeling has been very useful for, and I, I see a lot of nice work um, from a number of other groups as well, is, is situational awareness that actually, despite the amount of data out there, e even um, in the Ebola outbreak, we found that um, there's often not as much as could be done actually just collating what's already there. Um, and so one thing in particular is taking case data, doing some, some sort of reasonably simple statistical adjust adjustments to, to account for delays, work out when the infections are actually happening, and then now casting values like your reproduction number, making some short-term forecasts. So that can be incredibly useful for comparing countries. And um, so this work's hosted at FP Forecast. It's, uh, it's work um, led by Seb Funk and a number of colleagues. Um, but for example, when Italy was introducing its, its extensive measures in, in late Feb, early March, this was giving useful early indicators that reproduction number was coming down to one. And now, unfortunately, we're seeing in a number of countries in, um, in the, particularly in Latin America, um, quite a steep rise in cases. Um, I think India as well, a number of areas um, seeing this rise. So being able to, to monitor that is, is very useful. We've also early on did work um, looking at whether information on cases at the severe end of the spectrum could tell you about undetected transmission. So for example, as in Iran, when the first reported cases were deaths, if you rewind and think, well, when were those infections happening? What does that tell you about how much un undetected transmission must have occurred? And what does that say about the outbreak size? Um, and we developed some apps to, to help with situation awareness. Um, another key question is how much the outbreak uh, are people actually seeing? Uh, and so we've got some um, analysis online that uses the ratio of cases to deaths and then adjusts for delays in um, uh, delays to, from onset to outcome and knowledge about the, the case fatality risk to try and get a very, and I'll emphasize very rough idea of how much of, of the outbreak countries are seeing. But as we get um, serological data and testing data, it looks like a lot of estimates are in the right ballpark. So for example, in the UK, very early on, it was clear that the UK was probably detecting about 5% of its symptomatic cases. And I think that's reflected in the data we're now seeing. Um, other countries, um, Australia, uh, South Korea, I think Germany early on, but, but slightly lower now, we're seeing a, a much larger fraction of their outbreak. Um, and I think the other thing that's, that's really useful as a data stream is this real-time social behavior data. Um, some work shown here by colleagues uh, was looking at social mixing patterns. So it was, a, it was a social mixing survey conducted just after lockdown went in. And as far as I know, it was some of the earliest evidence that we'd probably got the reproduction number below one. And of course, at this point, there was still questions about whether actually a lockdown in, in this kind of setting in, in certain cities would actually get the, the reproduction number um, down you know, below one or below 0.5 or, or whatever. So actually having some social mixing data suggestive of that and then having case data and hospitalization back that up later, um, I think it was very, very useful. We're also looking at Google and Facebook data, but obviously because this wasn't collected for epidemiological purposes, those data probably don't quite represent um, what we think they represent. So we're seeing countries now with, with changes in mobility, but not changes in transmission. And we had a, a little bit of a look at Google mobility and found that actually there was a good association as R sort of declined to one in, in countries, particularly in, in sort of mobility and workspace and retail areas. But actually once R got below one, um, that association seemed to get much weaker. So it may be that actually mobility data is very useful at certain points in the epidemic for informing transmission, but maybe less useful elsewhere. Um, I think the other thing we're, we're finding is that these, can, these, these outputs aren't just useful for what they're designed for, but actually they've, they've got some nice um, follow-on applications. So for example, dynamics can be very useful for informing planning of relaxation of measures, for sort of post-lockdown monitoring. Uh, some work that came out today by um, by some other members of CMID was using NHS data, so 111, 999 uh, calls and, and online requests to try and estimate how much symptomatic infection there was in the community. Um, and we're also increasingly getting questions around you know, what, what might testing um, capacity requirements be. Um, collaborators are planning uh, serial surveys or maybe prospective surveillance what might the statistical power be for that study? Um, and then of course, things like uh, imported case risk as countries get low prevalence, where might 
uh, the risk of importations be given what neighboring countries are doing. So again, having these estimates of underreporting and true case dynamics uh, can actually feed into to a lot of other studies beyond the kind of just headline situation awareness um, that we're looking at. I just want to talk just uh, briefly a, a little bit about open science and outbreaks. Um, I think the field has got a lot better in the last few years. And this, this graphic here from uh, a nature piece has, has always really stuck, stuck with me because it shows the um, genome sequences uh, collected in West Africa or made publicly available from West Africa. Um, and early on, there was this paper that had uh, some sequences that, that showed the, the early cross-border transmission events. And basically, for the entire peak of the outbreak, the, the bit where, where all of the kind of burden was occurring, there was no sequence data um, released. It, was be, it had been collected, but it hadn't been released. And then we saw papers a year or two down the line pop up um, with analysis of these data sets. And I think a lot of it was just research culture just wasn't designed um, for, for outbreaks. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think it did show that something or, or a few things were probably broken in terms of the, the structure and incentives that we had in the system. I think things got better during Zika, data came out slightly quicker, and I think they've got better again um, in this outbreak. But I think there are some, some challenges still, um, and I'd certainly be interested to talk to people who've got any, any thoughts on those. But I think there's, there's four things that, particularly from, from my point of view, I think, um, or on our point of view as a group, I think are important. Uh, and that's for work to be fast, open, collaborative, and peer-reviewed. I just want to briefly go through um, what that might mean and, and how we might do a bit better. So fast, I think everyone knows traditional journal systems are, are probably too slow uh, to get work out. If you've got estimates that are useful, you want to get them out quickly. We noticed very early on that actually preprint servers were getting overwhelmed and we were getting quite long delays for processing. So we set up a dedicated repo um, where we could upload reports. And generally what we do is we upload the preprint to the repo with a summary and we submit to MedArchive and we put it to a journal all at the same time. Um, and then that means it's at least out being useful uh, slightly faster. Uh, we also try and make things open um, and again inspired by a lot of the other groups doing, doing really nice work in this area. Um, we try and get all the code and data outside, uh, available alongside any reports or papers. We find that actually dashboards and apps are really useful because while we're writing up more detailed analysis or papers, um, we can get the results as they currently are out and being used, even if we're actually working on some, some more developments or, or follow on analysis. Um, it's been really nice to see other groups kind of pick up our code and use it. And obviously we don't have a huge amount of development support, but we, we do what we can. Uh, and it's also been nice to see journalists kind of um, uh, the sort of more data, data journalist side of things uh, actually pick up on some of our estimates and apply it to their countries and, and run it on some of their data sets. Um, which I think is fantastic to see these tools in, in other people's hands. Um, collaborative research, I think, is obviously very important. Uh, I think academia does have some, some pretty lousy metrics sometimes in terms of how research is evaluated. I think particularly in outbreaks, it's clear that some of our traditional metrics um, don't really reflect work that's important. And you can have a lot of people, particularly e ECRs, doing um, really crucial work that's not visible or not easily publishable. Um, so I've listed a few examples here, uh, but you know, outbreak work just wouldn't happen without it. And so what we did was um, created a, a working group and, and basically said that every output is gonna have this team on it because even if they, they didn't initialize that specific bit of work, you know, the, the, the meta-analysis they've done, the Slack discussions, the papers they've highlighted, the data sets they've, they've been involved in, all of that stuff is, is key to, to our response functioning. And so we, we generally have the major contributors being named as, as the authors in the paper, but then we'll have um, the working group cover all of those, those sort of standing on the shoulders of giants type contributions. Um, and then where possible, we've also tried to encourage um, the, the researchers, particularly junior researchers involved, if there is opportunity for dissemination, um, getting them out. And we've, we've had some people do media training and tried to just sort of spread that, that sort of public face of it as, as best we can. Because I think it is, it is important to ensure that, that particularly people doing a lot of hard work on this, if it doesn't lead to a, a sort of paper in, in traditional academic sense, um, is still, still getting appropriate credit, credit and recognition for it. Um, the final thing is, is peer review, uh, which for all its, its foibles is a really important part of the academic process uh, to make sure that the work is, is reviewed by people who haven't been um, 
closely or directly involved. And, and we've kind of constructed our own version of it um, for rapid papers. So before anything goes online, we put it into this internal review system, which essentially consists of, we post a Google doc on Slack. We usually give a 48 hour deadline. Um, and if you, if you ever do this, you then just get a deluge of comments for the next two days. Um, but because it's crowdsourced, a lot of people just add a, a couple of comments and it means that, that it's not one person who's got this huge workload that actually you get incredibly good thorough feedback. Um, but you get it from a wide range of people, many of whom who won't have been uh, involved in initializing the original idea. Um, so we'll have some kind of really good perspectives. And then uh, we try to be quite strict on this, that if, if someone does have a real concern, um, even if it's, you know, if it's an ECR or PSC student or whatever, work doesn't go online uh, unless, you know, people are, are happy and, and think it's, it's at the right level of quality. So to summarize, I think there's, there's obviously, as we all know, a, a huge number of, of uses of, of outbreak modeling. And I've outlined a few of the ways I think we can probably develop a little bit further in these three that we're trying to, um, trying to build on. And I think for COVID on some of these questions, we're still very much in the early stages. Uh, and then I think outbreak science, we've made some fantastic pro progress since, since some of the, the sort of practices that happened during Ebola. Um, but I think there's more to go. What I've put up is certainly not the, the only way or even necessarily the best way, but, but hopefully it's something to consider and it would be great to, to talk more if people are interested in this sort of thing. So thank you. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Uh, I was uh, collecting uh, questions from the chat, so thank you for the nice talk, Adam. I didn't get any questions, so that was an easy job for me. Uh, let me put on my camera so you see me. So are there any people who want to ask questions now? You've got a raised hand. Yes, right. yes, Julia, please. No, no, no. You, you, Ellen's got her hand raised, so you can come oh, okay. and do that. So we'll go to Ellen. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Adam. I'm not sure if you can see me. Uh, um, it wasn't a very yeah. interesting question, but um, obviously the way you describe the internal process in the London School sounds brilliant. What do you think about, I mean, what, what I feel is really difficult from my point of view is working in a small team. Obviously, I don't have 69 people I can farm out um, a paper to. What do you think about, and, and I imagine lots of people here as well are kind of working in smaller groups than an enormous group. How do you think it should work on a kind of, on that kind of basis? Or how could it work? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and I realize we are, we are quite fortunate that now we've got quite a large, large group to go on. Um, I mean, I suppose having, uh, I guess, more kind of informal collaborate. I mean, just thinking at the moment, um, we've now got more and more collaborators come in through RAMP and through these kinds of schemes. So we've got kind of Slack channels that, that actually are the majority of that channel are people from smaller groups who are kind of joining. So it, I, I suspect what will happen is we may well end up arranging, you know, if we've got a theme where everyone's working on it, that almost becomes an informal working group on that topic. And a lot of people would end up contributing to it. Um, but I think that I think the challenge is, is one that kind of goes down to, to credit that if you've got if you've got people informally contributing regular feedback how do you do you include them on all things do you include them on some and I think we found it's, it's easier to have a clear blanket policy on that and then I think if you sort of do it project by project it becomes slightly harder but I think that's a really good question and I'm, I'm totally aware that that's something that not all groups um, will have the capacity to do. Thank you. Satisfied, uh, Ellen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> then I think uh, John, John P. also had his uh, hand up. So. Yes, yes. Uh, let me show my ugly face on video. Hello, Adam. Uh, at least from, I'm in Italy and in, in the public debate, the question is how the public reacts to modelers and their output. For the first months, the, the main news were the number of people in hospital or the number of dead, whatever they were, from a statistical point of view, those were the important numbers to follow. But now interest 
also in the public has turned to RT, the actual value of R, and that, that seems to be very important for politicians to speak about keeping this below one and otherwise we will have locked down again and whatever. What's your opinion on the best RT to communicate? What should RT be? That's a, that's a great question. I'm sure there's people on this call who could give much more thorough answers than I could. Um, I think we're similarly seeing the um, huge focus on R. Um, I mean, I think in part, I, I see our role as just emphasizing the complexity of it, that actually when you walk people through the ways that you'll calculate, I mean, I've, I've had a few journalists I've talked to and you sort of walk them through how you might calculate R from case data. And then very quickly, they're like, what, we can't have a precise value every day, can we? And I was like, well, no. Um, and so I think almost just just laying out the methods and and sort of giving people a rough sense of what feeds into it and the the trade offs I I think a lot of countries have in that you know you have these rough indicators early on and then as you wait two three weeks you have much more reliable data. Um, it sometimes seems to me that that that's probably the best thing we can do is actually just lay out the different ways it's being calculated and and just give that perspective. Yes, because I, I, I suppose that we will be following some kind of RT for the next year or so to be sure until we get the famous remedies and vaccines and stuff as the main think, indicator. And I think there's a good question. I mean, I, this is, I think, a, a much broader discussion that, that it'd be great to have other people's input on. But actually, yeah, what, it, what are the most reliable indicators if we're trying to, I suppose, yeah, if we're trying to prevent flare ups or if we're trying to manage an epidemic? what are what is the optimal combination where we can be confident for example it is below one or we can be confident that we've got the level of precision that we need to to sort of do whatever kind of monitoring that we're trying to do at that point in time mm. thank you uh, ellen did you raise your hand again or? I did, yeah um, <laughs> okay. adam i just had another question for you about um how useful it is or what you, uh, to have all this discussion about methodology development out in the open uh, and does it end up being confusing for people rather than actually helpful? That's a, that's a really good question. Yeah, it's how much do you want to tell people how the sausages are made, I guess. Um, I, th I think at the simple level, it's good to, I, th I think there's a danger and it, it's the, you know, the classic there's a magic model and it's got the right answer that I think a lot of people have the idea of. And I think it's, it's good to sort of move people a little bit away from that. Um, I think particularly if there's intuitive calculations that people can give a sense of, of you know, um, I mean, just thinking even, you know, describing some of the delays that are involved, like, oh, if there's infection here, you're gonna have to wait a bit of time to see that. I think most people are getting their heads around. Um, but I agree, you don't, and, and I think, I mean, certainly in the UK, there has been a bit, this model says this and this model says that and it, it gets all a little bit kind of silly. So I think trying to avoid those kind of discussions, but um, I guess, yeah, maybe just try to give people a framework because I, I suppose a lot of the stuff we do is, is just useful tools for thinking about dynamics. And maybe if we can get more people taking up those tools, that will kind of improve the quality of the debate. Maybe I'm being optimistic, but. Okay, thank you. Uh, Makina Morris was next to ask a question, uh, according to the chat. Okay, thank you. That was a great talk, Adam. Um, I wanted to, I've got two very different questions. The first, I think, is small, uh, follows up on uh, Jim Paolo's question. We talk a lot about estimating whether R is below one, but there, given the uncertainty in our estimates, um, You'd have to be usually pretty far below one before you really see a, uh, a change. And then the second thing is, so if you get it down to 0.99, are we okay? I mean, the way the public is now understanding this, it's like all you have to do is get it below one and then everything is fine. Um, so there, it seems like part of the message is still missing there. So that, that's one thing. Like it, it's not just one that I think that is the threshold that we're looking for. It's actually it's getting far enough below one that you really see a decline in real time. And what would that, you know, how far below one should we be aiming for? So it's kind of a re-education of, of how to think about that. And the second question after, after that, because that's small, <laughs> is um, I think both in, in Britain and, and in the U.S., you're seeing a profound politicization 
of this epidemic modeling and science. And my own sense, just you know, speculating about what's going to happen in the U.S., is that effectively, Trump is going to blame the CDC and epidemic modelers for having gotten us into this mess, um, and that's why we need to reelect him. Uh, and there's, given the uncertainty that's out there with our bottling tools, that plays very well with a lot of people. Um, so I don't even know how to phrase the question, actually. It's almost like we, were, we all got very excited that people were finally watching us. You know, they were actually, they care, they care about what we're doing for the first time ever. Um, and now the blowback, I think, is potentially I mean, really profound in some places. And so is there, I am, I'll, I'm sending that to the whole group really, which is kind of, um, how, do, how do we manage that with open science? So shall I do the first one and the group can do the second one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think, yeah, the first one's a good, I mean, there was actually quite a nice, the, the Financial Times did quite a nice piece a few days ago that took some of our, our estimates and some of the, um, the other ones coming out of Cambridge and PHE and did it as a very, these are two different modeling methods. No one's right, no one's wrong. There's just, this is different ways of doing it. Um, I think the more that maybe we can communicate that, that people realize it's not this kind of known truth that actually this is an inference. We're trying to get around it. I'll, I guess I'll comment briefly on the, the politicization, but I think there's a, there's a lot more discussion to be had there. Um, I think, yeah, we're seeing the same thing. I think you can, and I, I get, I get the sense in many countries um, because these decisions, you know, because the, the situation is so difficult that there's not a kind of clear answer. Um, I think there's things that we can do to help ourselves a little bit. I mean, we always almost just do a kind of search through manuscripts for the word should, and just make sure that, you know, there's not too much in there that you're saying you've got a solution and that this is, this is how the world ought to work. Cause I think a lot of these things there are unknowns. And I think in a lot of this, you know, we can kind of answer questions, but it's, it's sort of quite hard to come at it with a, a sort of simple way. But yeah, certainly in the UK, we're seeing increasing quite bizarre, you know, sort of, and yeah, you know, that, that sort of stringent social distancing was unnecessary somehow. And I think, you know, you don't need a model. You can just look at the situation in the world to work out that that's probably not a, not a great conclusion to come to. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that is going to be a, a, an increasing thing to be aware of. And I'd, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Um, can I, um, so, so I once had to explain in a different context the, uh, the notion of a critical, uh, this, was, this was to do with queues at the border, uh, at passport control, and again, it's the same thing, you know, if the arrival rate, it's queuing theory, you know, if the arrival rate is faster than the service rate, you get a queue out the back, and if it's the other way around, it dies away, so it's exactly the same maths, really. Um, I think we've done quite well as scientists to get the politicians and the journalists and the public, even as scientifically literate as they are in the present circumstance. So the idea that there is a model, that there is this reproduction rate and so on and so on. Of course, to some extent, it's all tautological because you can see the number of cases going down and then you say, oh, well, that's, quote, because our, is there someone will know it's because that is the same thing you're, you're just saying the same thing in two different ways so i wouldn't i think what matters when communicating science is first of all be as open as possible because it's not just the unwashed general public that are looking at the science it's actually other scientists and it's quite important that our scientific effort in the current epidemic should at least be credible to other scientists because actually some of the strongest voices who will criticize if they don't know enough are our scientists. So it's quite good to do that, both in order to equip those scientists who want to be helpful and frankly also to discredit those scientists who are deliberately spinning it rather than looking at the evidence. So I would be more relaxed. In answer to Martina's question, my, my reflection is, I think there's only two things you can get over here. First of all, as George Box, uh, whoever else has said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And secondly, sorry, three, that there is this parameter. It's not, you know, things are much more complex, but you can sort of sum it all up in an exponential growth or shrinkage rate. Um, and that's important. And thirdly, 
that every outcome is very uncertain. And so you can't be sure ever exactly what will happen if you do something or other. And all you can get is an approximate idea. And of course, you'll have to do sometimes, you'll have to try something and then you'll discover it won't work and you'll have to row back on it. But you know, that's just like ordinary life really. So it's a matter of being clear about what we can say about being very modest about not telling people what to do and also about understanding that we know there's uncertainty and we should certainly communicate that. Okay, well, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Any more burning questions? Because if Well, not, can I have myself one? Uh, okay. Uh, I will, uh, so it's almost Lorenzo's time, so I, it will only be uh, perhaps a remark and Adam can perhaps comment on that. My uh, feeling, if there are no journalists or people from the general public listening, is that if your R not estimate is close to one, then your model is probably then you're probably missing something in your model because if your model is wrong, you almost get something critical. For for example, it's uh, you describe something by uh, exponential growth or de decline while it is actually spatial, so it's quadratic or so, so on. So if you're, uh, what you see in a lockdown, for example, is that movement get, goes down and perhaps the spread becomes more spatial. So then your R0 estimate might, well, or it becomes subcritical, or your R0, it stays actually super critical, but it becomes percolation process instead of, um, exponential growth branching process and yeah your r naught is one so you might be close to say if you think but actually your model is just wrong and perhaps you should keep that in mind that we probably miss something if we have an r naught estimate which is fairly close to one and um, want to reply uh, i see uh, some very long talk here uh, or a longer comment which I try to read. I think that's yeah I think that is yeah. that's something I have to think a bit more about I think about actually the, the sort of model structures and how that fits I mean I think there's there's I think there's also the wider point of the resolution you do that I think a lot of countries currently have like US has R equal to one and it's actually just a bunch of sub-national epidemics doing very different yeah. things yeah yeah I think it's the kind of point you're trying to make yeah yeah okay well, I think we should. Yeah, I think we should move on. Uh